Hey everyone, we've got some exciting news for you. Indeed we do. We've been working on a new book for the last two years and it's here and it's so exciting. It's called The Adjacent Possible, Evolve Your Art. From blank canvas to prolific artist. And this is what we're really about, is evolving your art. And we've been talking about that on the blog. For, for a long time, if you've been reading the blog, we've been dropping hints that something was coming and uh, what it was going to be about. And here we are. Here it, yeah, we are here. So it's so exciting. It's, it's so interesting uh, because this book has stories in it. And it also talks about the adjacent possible, which we, we've been talking about on here, and how important that is in evolving your art because it's it comes from a concept from evolutionary biology. And it's been something Bruce has been thinking about with Stuart Kaufman and other scientists since the early 90s and talking about and exploring at the Santa Fe Institute. So here it is. And one of the things that's really fun about this and, and compelling to me is that for the first week or so, we've got the ebook up on Amazon for 99 cents. It is going to go up, but for, for now, for 99 cents, and you can get a copy, and it would be really helpful if you did that and left a review because it makes a huge difference because reviews are the lifeblood of Amazon, it drives the algorithm. And it brings visibility to the book. And one of the reasons why that's important is that we have a mission in that the first 30 days of sales of the book, including the 99 cent sales and anything else, is going 100% to working towards alleviating food insecurity. And we're going to donate 100% of proceeds to Feeding America and to community fridges, which is something we've been dealing with community fridges. We have a community fridge and we've had it for over a year. It's a small refrigerator out on the curb in front of our house. And we put food out there for people who, who need it. And they come and get it as when, when they do. And also, once we started doing that, other people, just neighbors, started pitching in and even uh, grocery stores and restaurants started bringing food and filling the refrigerator you know, without, without interacting with us. It just became this self-sustaining thing and it's used a lot. Well, we find that our neighbors are noticing that a lot of elderly are coming around, taking a few things and this is really good because I know a lot of elderly are struggling with food insecurity and have been especially during the pandemic. So this is this is like a passion I've had for years and our daughter's gotten heavily involved in it. In fact, she's run the community fridge here, uh, but she's taking off for university in Scotland um, in about a week. And so Bruce and I are going to be running the community fridge. <laughs> we are, we're going to be empty nesters and it gives us something to do. <laughs> right, well, we've, we've got a lot to we've do. We've got a lot to do. So anyway, with that, I hope you'll go over to Amazon, get a copy. Um, if you'd like to be part of the book launch team, we've got that down below. We'll have links below if you would like to join in the movement to get the word out, to share this, to make a difference, because you make a difference. And not only will this book be helpful for your art and going to that place of not only experimenting but evolving your art that is moving beyond repeating not only others but yourself and continually being on that edge of one foot in the known one foot in the unknown which is where amazing art comes from and innovation not only that but you'll also be part of supporting a movement to help alleviate food insecurity one book at a time one action at a time so thank you so much for being here. And now I'm going to give a reading of the first chapter of The Adjacent Possible, our newest book, and I'll see you in a moment. Bye-bye. 
The Adjacent Possible, Chapter 1 The Paradox An Artist's Trajectory Consider an artist, we'll call her Grace, toiling in obscurity for 15 years, whose fate changed in a matter of weeks. A friend invited her to submit two paintings for possible inclusion in a local museum exhibition. While Grace didn't often exhibit her work, she had recently experienced a breakthrough in her art, an exhilarating feeling like teetering on a razor's edge between creation and collapse. Somehow, her experimental paintings held together when they hadn't before. Exploring edges and unexpected intersections of lines, she reveled in the contrasts of gritty and smooth, ugly and luscious, and the marks and fields of color that emerged. A little voice inside her head said, why not submit these new works for the upcoming museum show? Three months later, to her great surprise, two of her paintings were selected for the exhibition. By this time, she had almost forgotten she had applied. She delivered the paintings by strapping them to the roof of her trusty old Honda, wrapped in plastic because they were too big to fit inside. Grace's Big Break. Later, arriving at the opening, she was speechless when she saw her two large paintings prominently displayed, one with a best of show ribbon hanging beside it. A San Francisco art critic lauded her work in the local paper ahead of the show, calling it edgy, revolutionary, a cross between Bryce Martin and Joan Mitchell. Word got out. The room was buzzing like an artistic bee colony awaiting their queen. A murmured swept across the space as her heels clicked through the doorway. Artists and collectors jockeyed for position. Champagne glasses held at chest height serving as defensive weaponry. A superficially polite artistic scrum. As she made her way to her painting, her friend whispered, do you know who that man is? He's the art critic for the San Francisco Comical. He's friends with the museum curator. After the opening, Invitations arrived for solo exhibitions in museums across the country. To Grace's delight, she was able to retire her Honda and drop the two part-time jobs she was holding down to keep the lights on. Two weeks later, her big break came when a gallery in New York known for rejecting artists without an MFA from Yale or Columbia, offered Grace a one-woman show. She couldn't say no. The New York opening. In the velvet plushness of the air-conditioned classic old Manhattan hotel, sweat soaked her taffeta dress as she stepped into beige six-inch heels. A chill coursed through her body as her jaw locked up and her teeth chattered uncontrollably. How was she going to speak? She had imagined this moment for years, but dismissed it as a paint-thinner-induced fantasy. Perhaps the aromatic hydrocarbons had addled her brain. It was an improbable dream would she blow it with self-conscious awkwardness? But something else bothered her. In the whirlwind three years after the museum show in San Francisco 
punctuated with shows and interviews. And despite her newfound popularity and financial security, a growing sense of vulnerability and dread had crept over her. She felt exposed. She had dreamt of being a celebrated artist, yet the reality terrified her. What if they changed their mind about my art? In her studio, she'd stare at her prized paintings and wonder how she could create more paintings like these. Were these winners a fluke? Can I keep this up? Afraid to make a move lest she ruin a painting, or worse, create something mediocre, she waited, hoping for inspiration, desperate for a solution. She shivered as she recalled the frenzied months of creating the first 24 of 25 paintings that would hang in the New York show. A few months prior, Canis O'Carrollen, an Irish art critic, wrote a blistering review of her last exhibition, calling it derivative and pedestrian. She dreaded his criticism. He was the tail that wagged the dog of the art world, feared by artistic pedestrians. Struggling to create the series of paintings for the show, she tried to push her art further, to experiment, but ended up taking only minor risks and merely slightly varying each subsequent painting. Her seminal painting from three years prior kept getting in the way, as if it were a paint-by-number template tattooed on her retina. A plan doggedly followed. Canis was right. She had repeated herself. She had two weeks left and one painting to complete before shipping the new series to New York, this time not upon her Honda's roof. Reviewing the first 24 paintings, she felt humiliated. She yearned to disappear, to run back to the time before anyone knew her work, but it was too late. Canis would likely be at the show. It would be a disaster. She slept fitfully. A crying newborn appeared in her dream world studio, and she awoke, startled by the image. She needed to do something new, something radical. What have I got to lose? Even an ugly painting is better than a predictable one. She loaded her number eight Escoda sash brush with black latex house paint and lost all sense of time. A hotel room in New York. In the hotel room in New York, reaching for Xanax, she spilled the bottle. Her contacts not yet in, eyes too myopic to find her glasses, she raked the carpet with her fingers. Like her mother and grandmother, she carried the lineage of blind artists dotting her family tree like blurry leaves. Her heartbeat throbbed in her ears as the room's walls closed in. She found the cool, hard pill near her feet and gulped it. The exhibition was starting in an hour. Would Canis be there? The exhibition. The opening had been underway for a half hour when she arrived, breathless, from the taxi. She had spilled chamomile tea on her skirt but folded the voluminous material to hide the stain. The tapping of her stilettos as she walked in on wobbly toothpick legs made her self-conscious. Why had she not bought the $900 designer shoes instead of the $100 ones? As she teetered into the show, she saw a crowd gathered around a painting in the ante room of the gallery. 
It was her last painting of this series, the one she had just finished. The room grew louder, fueled by banality and champagne. Canis held court as he discussed the painting in his inimitable gruff voice. A leather-lunged bellower, his words carried across the room as he gesticulated animatedly. Grace's throat tightened as she neared the group. Creating that last painting was exhilarating. It was completely different from the first 24. What did Canice think of it? As she approached, Canice turned towards her. His eyes squinted with a quizzical expression. The room fell silent, her raspy breath deafening to her ears. Bracing herself, she imagined he would say something like, here's Miss Flash in the pan, because Canis was known for barking at artists, both in person and in writing. What he said instead was, did you actually paint this? To read more, get a copy of the book, leave a review. I'd love to hear your thoughts and thank you.